Hello? Oh, good morning, Radiant Church. How are we doing? Good, everybody all right? 11 o'clock service, welcome Portage. Good to see you, good to be worshiping with you. My name's John, I'm the campus pastor here at Richland, also one of the teaching pastors, and I'm honored to be with you today. Pastor Lee sends his greetings. He's ministering at a church in North Carolina where it's probably sunny and godly and things, no, I'm just kidding. We're glad. Glad to be in Michigan. Hey, uh, I've got the handheld mic today because I told the production team that uh, you guys might be shouting me down today and I might have to be louder than normal. So they, they equip me with this. And production, sound guys, graphics, there's some of the, the people who don't normally get recognized unless something goes wrong. You know what I mean? Like the sound goes off, the mic doesn't work or something. We all do our neck crane to see who doesn't love Jesus back there. But the truth is, they do an amazing job. They're part of the worship experience, the life. So turn around. Let's give some honor. JoJo, David, Sean Downs, our camera operators. We love you. We love you. We love you. We honor you. Super grateful for you. So hey, we're uh, in the second week of a series. And as the video roll-in showed, it's on the book of Malachi. So if you brought your Bibles, you can turn to Malachi. It's the last book in the Old Testament. It's right before Matthew and right after Hezekiah or something like that. I don't know. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and Pastor Lee, if you didn't listen to last week's message, you, you need to go back to it. He really did a fabulous job, as he always does, sort of uh, highlighting what's happening uh, contextually with God and with God's people during the book of Malachi. So I'm not going to take a lot of time on that. But what's, uh, the, the synopsis of that is this, is that God's people are in a period of transition, in a period of waiting. And it's 400 years between Malachi and the book of Matthew. And during that time, uh, as they're waiting, as they know about the promises of God, but they've yet to see the fruition of the promises of God, the Bible says that the people's hearts begin to turn cold. They become disconnected with God. Literally, they lose their first love. And this book of Malachi is, is a dialogue between God and his people. And he's literally, through the prophet Malachi, drawing them back, reminding them of his goodness and of his faithfulness. So the whole book starts out with, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And then they ask, well, you, how have you loved me? That's what God's saying. And he tells them, and he begins to unfold the, the goodness and the faithfulness that he's shown them. I want to pick up in verse 6 of chapter 1 of Malachi. It'll come on the screen if you don't have your Bible. And God, again, is speaking to the people, and he says this, A son honors his father. And a servant is master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or those that are sick, is that not evil? And what God is talking about here is that the people's worship had begun to become hollow. They were just going through the motions. They weren't honoring God with their best, with their first fruits, with their flocks and herds. They were bringing the sick, the lamb. Okay, God, we'll give you this. because it's. And Pastor Lee is next week going to talk specifically about worship, about what that means for us as followers of Jesus. But today I want to just hone in. I want to kind of set the stage for that by talking about honor. Verse six says, God says to his people, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? Everybody say honor. Honor, it's a word we know, it's a word we sing a lot about, it's a word we use with, with judges and magistrates, your honor. But I feel like we sometimes may be confused about what that word means biblically. Like what, who are we supposed to honor? When are we supposed to honor? Do, do we always have to honor? And, and those are some of the questions I want to talk about today because honor is extremely important to God. The thread of honor is all throughout Scripture, and we'll look at some of that today. And I'm going to go through a lot of Scripture, so I'll have you turn some places. Others just write down or follow on the screen if you don't have time. But uh, I, I'm thinking about honor, and I've been on several mission trips uh, overseas and I usually try to do a little bit of research about, okay, like what cultural things are happening there that may be different uh, than here so that we, we don't, you know, have a dishonoring situation. So I've never been to Korea. I have some friends who are Korean. But one of the things they do there to show honor is they'll do like a, a little bow, not like a whole bent over bow, but sort of like a lowering yourself. And that's a, shi a sign of showing honor to someone else. And one of the things you wouldn't do if you were in Korea is you wouldn't kick your feet up 
on the coffee table if you were at someone's house because showing your feet or the soles of your feet is considered dishonoring. They're, they're dirty from traveling and things like that. So those are some of the cultural uh, ways that you show honor there. I went to South Africa in 2007 on a mission trip, and one of the things we learned is that when you're shaking someone's hand, you actually extend your hand, but then you grab your elbow with your other hand. So you shake hands like that as a sign of honor. Um, and so we practiced that. And then there were some words and phrases you didn't want to use there that are okay here. One of them I remember was the word fanny pack. Um, as cool as that is here in America, apparently, you don't say that in South Africa. So there's these things that that would be dishonoring to them. And, and we look at America, uh, and again, I don't, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I don't think there's much argument in the fact that we are becoming, in many ways, a nation that is without honor. We, we have um, allowed dishonor, not just to, it's always existed, but if, in my opinion, when we look at our culture today in America, dishonoring is actually becoming more normal and more acceptable than actually showing honor. If, if you look at pundits on TV, talking heads, news, comedians, Twitter accounts, activists, bringing people down, dishonoring people actually will help you become more popular in many circles in America today. It will actually help build your platform. And so dishonor has become so rampant that we don't even really recognize it. It doesn't even really attract our attention. And way too often, even as Christians, we're okay with it in our lives and in our culture. So I wanna talk about honor and what God says about honor and who God says that we're required or we're supposed to honor. So I'm gonna give you a couple definitions. Uh, I said we don't always know exactly what it means, but this is the Greek word for honor. So when you read honor in your New Testament, that is the word time. It's spelled T-I-M-E, but it's pronounced time. And it means this, to value or to highly esteem, to treat as precious, weighty, or valuable. So to honor something is to treat it as precious, as valuable, to honor it, to esteem it. That word weighty is actually a word that they used when they measured money. Shekels were the monetary form in the first century, and there were these uh, coins. And the heavier, the weightier they were, the more you had, the more honor, the more that it did for you. And so that's the, the idea behind the weightiness of honor. And then to dishonor, that word is atimos, A-T-I-M-O-S, and it simply means to disdain, to treat as common or ordinary. So to dishonor something is to look at it and say, okay, yeah, whatever, it's common, that's ordinary, kind of roll your eyes, yeah, I know that, I've been there, done that, seen that before. That's dishonoring something, whereas honoring is bringing value or elevating it to a place of honor. So, for example, when I was a young man, I think it was 10, for a season, I was hardcore collecting tops Football cards. Anybody remember Topps football cards? Three of us. Okay, yes, a few of us. I love them. I went to the Upper Deck in Grand Rapids. It was in the Elger Heights area, and I would use any money that I had from my paper route. I was a very pragmatic, hardworking lad. I'll let you know that. Uh, and I would buy these cards. So I had all of the 80s icons of Jerry Rice, Joe Montana, you know, Howie Long of the Raiders, and I just loved these football cards. But uh, an opportunity came where I had a Barry Sanders uh, card, and I had an opportunity to go to the Silver Dome with a friend and meet some of the Lions. And Barry Sanders signed my card. And he looked at me and said, you look like someone who's going to be a great preacher. So no, he didn't say any of that. <laughs> but he did sign it. And he gave it back to me, and I was like, ah! you know, I, that card was everything to me. Like, I liked all of my cards, but some of them, you know, if the corners got frayed, no big deal. You know, if they were an offensive lineman, I might put them in my spokes of my bike, you know, so it sounded like a motorcycle, like, Brrr, you know. But this one, it got its own separate sleeve. I put it high on my dresser. I prayed to it. No, I didn't do that. I didn't. But I, I loved it. And I honored it, and it, it had value. It was no longer common. It was no longer ordinary. It was something of weight and of value to me, and that's what honor does. And honor is a big deal to God. And so I want to, in the few minutes that we have, go through five people groups that God calls us to honor, uh, five situations, five ways that God calls us to honor. So let's just pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. Father, in the name of Jesus, you promised us that your word, when it was spoken, would not return void, but it would accomplish 
all that you sent it to do. So I ask the Holy Spirit of God to illuminate the word of God in every single heart that, Lord, we would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts and spirits to receive whatever you're saying to us. We silence the voice of the enemy. We silence distractions. We put our focus and our eyes and our minds on you alone in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All right, who does the Bible say that we're supposed to honor? First and foremost, we're called to honor God. Nice, nice, A minus for all of you. Fruit snacks on your way out. Okay, yes, we honor God first and foremost, and we get that. Uh, at least we should, because God is separate from us. The Bible says God is holy. God is greater than we are. There is nothing common and nothing ordinary about God. Look what it says in Revelation chapter four, which if you read is a picture of heaven. John the apostle is having a vision of what heaven looks like on the island of Patmos. In verse nine of Revelation four, John says this, and whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who's seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders would fall down before him who was seated on the throne and they would worship him who lives forever and ever and they would cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created in heaven right now 24 hours a day for all of eternity, God is being honored and worshiped and revered. And as children of God, that is our cry. That is our mantra. That is our responsibility is to honor God in everything that we do, to never get familiar with God, to never have it be, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. I've seen that, read that, done that, been to church. But to always let the awe and wonder of God rekindle and reignite passion and zeal for the presence of God. God is worthy of honor. And I wanna show you, if you have your Bible, turn to Mark chapter six, what happens when you're in an environment where God isn't honored? Obviously, we're free will people, and we can choose to honor God or not honor God. And in this situation, let me give you a little context from Mark six. Jesus has, is in the middle of a teaching tour where he's going to all the different cities and villages in the nation of Israel, and he's preaching and teaching in the synagogues, and then miraculous signs and wonders are following his teachings. He was just in Capernaum. The Bible says all of the sick in the city were brought to him, and he healed every single one of them. Blind eyes were being opened. Somebody couldn't see. Jesus spit in the dirt and made mud and put that in his eyes, and it was like, can you see now? I don't know if Jesus is like joking or what, but, but then he rinsed it off, and he could see deaf ears, demon-possessed people being restored. All around Jesus, miracles are happening. But then he enters his hometown, Nazareth. Not where he was born, that's Bethlehem, but this is where Jesus grew up. And that's where we pick it up in Mark 6. And it says, Jesus went away from there and he came to his hometown. And his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? How is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? So they're hearing Jesus. They, the, Jesus' reputation has preceded him into his hometown of the miracles, and they're just astounded, but then something interesting happens. They begin to dishonor Jesus. They dishonor God. Look what it says. They start to be offended. And verse three says, is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. They looked at Jesus. They may have been initially kind of awed and wonder at, at his words that he spoke, but then they started to say, wait a minute. I know who that is. That's Jesus. He's that kid that none of us like because he never got in trouble and he did everything right. And aren't his brothers here right now? And isn't he, uh, he was a carp. Didn't he make your kitchen table? I mean, who is this guy? How does he think he's, he's different or whatever, better than us? And they began to dishonor Jesus. They saw him as normal, ordinary, common. And then look what happens. It says, and Jesus said to them, verse four, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled at their unbelief. I don't know all of the theological implications 
of this, but the Bible doesn't say Jesus wouldn't do mighty works, like he got mad at them and was like, fine. You wanna dishonor me, whatever. It says he could not do mighty works because of the dishonoring that had taken place prior to his arrival, prior to his wanting to move in the miraculous. So in every other town where people are being set free and healed, these people literally blocked the presence and access of God into their lives because they refused to honor Jesus for who he was. And I wanna submit to you that in our culture, of dishonor, our culture of dragging people's names through the muds, our culture of, of always, you know, kind of bomb throwing on Twitter or Facebook at, at every person we disagree with, we are literally blocking the ability of God to do the mighty works that he wants to do in our lives, in our cities, and in our homes because we're not honoring God. He could do no mighty works, wanted to, but honor is one of the keys that unlocks the blessing and favor and power of God. So first and foremost, we wanna honor God. I think most of us get that. The rest of them, uh, and you're already quiet, and the rest of them are harder. But we'll just press on in faith. You ready? Number two, God says we're to honor our family. The most common phrase used with honor in Scripture is this. Honor your father and your mother. And I got a big amen from the parents. Come on. That's what it says. It's in the top 10. It's an actual one of the 10 commandments. Honor your father and your mother. Ephesians 6 says it this way. It says, honor your father and mother that it may be well with you and you may live long in the land. So I tell my children, do you want to live a long time, kids? Do you want to see 13? Okay, wait. Honor your mother and your father. And then the verse goes on and says, and fathers, do not exasperate or do not provoke your children unto wrath. So there's something that's supposed to be in the household that demonstrates honor so that our children walk in honor as we walk in honor. And it's very important to God. You can read in Exodus some of the laws that took place if there was dishonor in a home, and it was pretty intense, I'll put it that way. And so honor, and, and obviously God has to look at our nation, our generations today, and see the dysfunction and the dishonor and the way that so many households have a lack of honor and really a spirit of dishonor and, and it has to break his heart because he is a father with a family. And listen, I'm not up here saying that when I walk in the door after work, my children all gather around me and bow and say, how can we serve you, oh masterful father? I understand. But we as parents have to create an environment where we do not allow dishonor to run wild. We do not allow dishonor to be a thing in our homes. We, tr we teach our children how to honor and we treat our children with honor so that they can grow up and honor us, so that they can honor their mother and father. And this is, this is important because I was in youth ministry a long time and I worked with many teenagers over 10 years. And one young lady in particular I'm reminded of uh, had a rough, a rough upbringing. And her dad left their family when she was very young and, and left with another woman, abandoned their family and her mom struggled with addiction, so they were always in and out of foster care. Her mom would, you know, not pay the bills, so they would get evicted, and, and there was just this massive dysfunction. And so she said to me, she came to our youth and said, how am I supposed to honor my mother and father when I'm in a situation like this? There's nothing that they're doing that's remotely honorable. And that's a good question, and that's what I wanna ask, and I wanna try to explain biblically. Are we required to honor people who aren't honorable. And here's what I wanna to say to you. And this is what I believe, respect, and this is what I told this young lady, respect is earned, and here's what I mean by that. When you look at somebody's life, when you look at what they've done, the decisions they've made, you can say, I respect that, there's, there's something to that, and, and I'll, I'll honor that. But honor, in and of itself, isn't earned, it's given. Respect is earned, honor is given. And so you can honor your parents because of the position that they're in, because of the office, if you will, that God has given them of your parents. Now, does it doesn't mean that everything they do is honorable. It doesn't mean that you have to somehow say, well, this is just my lot in life and, and I have to, I guess, honor them. Here's what it means. Here's what I told this young lady. You wanna know how you can honor your mother? Forgive her first. Forgive her in your heart, release her. 
of what's happened to you. I'm sorry that that happened. That's not God's best. That's not God's will, but you release her. Then you pray for her. You pray for the spirit of God to touch her. You pray for the power of God to release her from her chains, from her addictions. And then three, you refuse to speak evil of her. So easy when somebody hurts us or wrongs us to go to someone else. You won't believe what they did. You won't believe what this church allows. You won't believe what this happened. And we drag people through. One of the ways you can show honor is simply by saying, I am not going to dishonor them by dragging their name through the mud to other people. That's one of the ways. And then I told her, maybe the most important thing you can do is redeem those memories for your children someday. You know that that's how the enemy works is generationally. You see that. You see dysfunction in a home, and it goes from generation to generation. The enemy wants your kids to suffer, their, then their kids and their kids' kids, until somebody puts a stake in the ground and says, not today, devil. I choose to honor I choose to forgive. I choose to stand in the place of honoring even when someone isn't honorable. I hope, that, I hope that makes sense to you. I'm not saying we make a blanket statement that everything people do is okay. What I'm saying is you can honor even when you disagree. You can honor even when someone else isn't acting in honor. What we've told ourselves in society today is, oh, unless you're acting honorable, I don't have to honor you. And until you do, I can just stand back here and throw bombs at you and, and get mad at you on Twitter and gossip about you. That's not honor. And so young people in here, honor your father and mother. Refuse to speak evil. Ask God to help you and to grace you to be able to do that. The second part of family is we're called to honor our spouse. Honor the person that you're married to. Raise your hand if you're married in here. Yes. Raise your hand if you want to be married in here. I'm just kidding. You don't have to do that. Hey. This is what the Bible says in 1 Peter. It says, husbands, honor your wives. Why? So that your prayers won't be hindered. That's one thing. And then in Ephesians 5, Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands. Honor your husbands as Christ, as unto Christ. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. There is a honor code that has to be in existence among married people. So if you want your marriage to be ordinary and you want your marriage to be common, then go ahead and don't honor your spouse. Walk in dishonor. Because you wanna know what ordinary, common, and normal is in the United States? One out of every two marriages fail. That's normal. That's common. So if you want to have something that's extraordinary, that's supernatural, then choose to honor even when maybe the person you're married to isn't being honorable. I know, it's hard to hear, but I'm telling you. If you want your husband, you know, I can hear it. And I have heard it. And it's not just wives, it's husbands too. But it's like, well, I would honor him if he'd ever done anything honorable in his whole life. <laughs> and that, honestly, I get that. But that's not the point. What I'm saying to you is you get into your prayer closet and you begin to confess to God and pray to God what you want to see in your husband, in the secret place. God, I thank you that I married a man of God. I thank you that your spirit is at work in him. I thank you, you know the plans and purposes you have for his life, and I choose to honor him. And I don't understand everything that's happening, but God, I trust you no matter what. That's how you honor in the midst of a relationship that might not be easy to honor. Because what happens when, when you're dating, when you're, when you're engaged, why is it, why is there so much less conflict? Because you're intentional about honoring, right? You make a big deal. Oh, no, 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 honey, here, I'll get the door, right? Oh, I brought you flowers. You're in a long-distance relationship. I'm going to be right over. It's a 17-hour drive. Don't worry. I'll be right there. I'm on my way. I mean, nothing's too difficult. You never go too far. You're talking on the phone, you know, for four and a half hours. Okay, you hang up. No, you hang up. Okay, I'll count to three and we'll both hang up. One, two, three. Are you still there? I love you. <laughs> We're intentional about it. And then something happens. We, we get married and suddenly it's, uh, it's common. Uh, it's ordinary. Uh, nothing's that weighty anymore. It's like, yep, you know, hey, can you please pass the ketchup? What am I, your slave? And everything's, we freak out. And we go psycho all of a sudden. And we start keeping track. If they don't do this and they don't do that, I'm telling you. Honor your wife, honor your husband, speak it over them and watch the miracles of God take place in your marriage. It's so easy to go negative. Bible says in Proverbs 18, death and life are in the power of the tongue 
And those who love it will eat its fruit. If you speak death, if you speak worst case scenarios over your husband, over your situation, and you find yourself gossiping, you're, you're gonna have those things in your life. But I'm telling you, if you speak faith, if you speak life, if you confess the promises of God, those are the things that will manifest in your situation, all right? So we honor God, we honor family. The third thing is God calls us to honor those who are in authority over us. God has positioned people in our lives, and I use that word on purpose, positioned them, because that's where they are in our lives. So I want you to think about bosses, teachers, coaches, police officers, government officials. Those are all people that God has put as authority figures in our lives and has called us to unequivocally honor them. And I feel like, again, in our culture, it is so easy. Anyone we disagree with, anyone we don't see eye to eye with, we instantly gravitate to the negative, gravitate to the worst case, and gravitate to saying, I don't have to honor you. And it's, it's permeating our culture. You look at some of the teachers, the way that students, and, and, and you look at some of these coaches. I mean, you see six and seven-year-olds in sports and their parents. Don't raise your hand if you're one of those parents. <laughs> It's just like, I can't believe this, and you're not playing my boy. And, and what you're doing is you're setting up your family, your children, to inherit a spirit of dishonor. Now listen, coaches aren't perfect. Police officers aren't perfect. Teachers aren't perfect. And I'm not saying people shouldn't be held accountable if they make mistakes. If, 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 if a teacher is inept and can't teach, they should be fired. But you can have honor in your heart while you're disagreeing with someone. And I feel like we have taken authority and we've made it a bad word. And, we, and we've made it a, a, just this like neon sign of authority and it's just this terrible thing. And God says, no, I have given authority over you. Look at Romans chapter 13, verses one and two. And just listen to this. This is Paul. He's writing this in Rome and this is not from Cancun at a resort. The Roman government was not like super nice to Christians at this time. Some of them were being impaled and, and put in Nero's garden and lit on fire. And listen to what Paul says through the Holy Spirit. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Raise your hand if you're everyone in here. Okay, Portage, raise your hand. Come on, you're all right. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. And the authorities that do exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Ouch. God's saying that the people that we have in authority in our government right now are not outside of the scope of God's plan. And I feel like, I don't know that I've ever witnessed a more divided nation politically. Like, you're either in this camp or that camp and there is no middle ground and we have believed the lie that if I disagree with you, I hate you. And if you think that way, you're the worst. And it, it goes all the way up to the top. And I'm telling you, as Christians, whether you agree with who's in office or you disagree with who is in office, you can still show honor to the office even if you can't honor the person. And that's the difference between us as Christians and the rest of the world. So I don't care what the news media is saying. I don't care what the pundits are saying. I don't care what you read on Twitter. As a Christian and follower of Christ, you're called to honor those who are in authority. That's, that's just it. And does that mean we agree with everything? No, that's the beauty of this country is you can just vote. Like, don't vote for them. Fine, next time. And, and, and it's a cycle. In a few years, someone else will be president, and everyone will be like, no, the world can be saved. And everyone else will be like, we're doomed. That's, that, it's insane to me how that works. And so we sing songs like, I will build my life upon your love. It is my firm foundation. I will put my hope in you alone because your love can never be shaken. And I don't remember who said it, but someone said, Christians don't tell lies, they sing them. And so we say, I will put my trust in you alone. And yet all of a sudden, oh my, they're in power in government? Oh, we're all dead. And that's how we work. Listen, I'm, and I'm being serious. If you have more faith in a elephant or a donkey to help you than you do in the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. I'm sorry, and I'm fine with politics. Get involved, vote, exercise your right, but at the end of the day, we are from a different kingdom. We're not of this world. And so it's, read Psalm 47 every single day this week. 
The nations rage and the nations quake, but God is on the throne. And we can't become so obsessed. And we can't just throw bombs and say, I hate you and I hate them. And this person's the worst. And our president, listen, whether you like our president or you don't like our president, I don't care. But before you go and you drag someone's name through the mud and before you recount all of the things that they've done wrong, you have better, as a Christian, have been in your prayer closet asking God to speak to him, to instill wisdom in him, to save whatever God needs to do. If, if you're not on your knees praying, as the Bible says in Romans 13 to do, for our leaders, you have absolutely no place to complain. And that's my opinion. You can't do it then. If, you, if your heart hasn't been broken in the place of prayer, and, and instead we just say, well, they're this, they're that, they're this, they're, he, did this, he did that, whoever it is, we sound a lot more like the Pharisees than followers of Jesus. When the Pharisee and the tax collector went to the temple, the Pharisee started his prayer this way. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, adulterers, extortionists, or even like this tax collector. No, 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 me, no, no, I tithe on all of my mint, I go to the, and we start rallying off, they're doing this, this, and this, and I'm telling you, it, it, it is much more like a Pharisee than the heart of God, and we have to pray. And we have to press in and we have to believe that God's still on the throne no matter what's happening. And honor is less about what someone is doing and more about our hearts. We can disagree and still honor. Make sense? Still like me? Okay, good. Last, number four. Number five. Oh no, I'm sorry, number four, spiritual authority. So it's along the same lines, but it's a little different. God has given pastors and leaders, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, to equip the saints. That's, that's the job of the church leaders is not to do all of the work necessarily, but to encourage and equip the people, you, to go out into the world with the love of Jesus Christ. And look what it says concerning honor in verse 17 of 1 Timothy 5. Paul says, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. The Bible is the only time the Bible mentions double honor. Um, so basically what that means is if you're going to bring your boss a dozen cookies, I need two dozen cookies if you want to follow the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. Here's what, here's what it means is that God has said, I have established pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, at the fivefold ministry in order to equip the saints. And there is an honor. And we have a culture, unfortunately, even within the church that is so quick to dishonor people that may have said something or may have done something that you don't agree with or I didn't like that song or I didn't like what he said. And we look at other, not even just in this church, we look across the body of Christ. Oh, that guy, he's, he doesn't even believe in hell and that guy bought his wife that and how, how can they have to live in this? And we have this spirit, I'm telling you, it's a spirit of dishonor that comes through our lives even in the church and we're modeling that for our families, we're modeling that for our children. We have the pastor for lunch every day, you know, can you believe he did this and did that and, and the Bible says, honor those who are in spiritual authority over you. And again, that doesn't mean we're perfect. I don't know if you realize that. I, I might be, but the rest of the people up here are. Listen, there are no perfect leaders. There are no perfect churches. I want to read something. I'm going to paraphrase it. It's in Genesis chapter 9, but it's the story of Noah. Raise your hand if you've heard of Noah in here. Okay, most of us. Noah built in. Yeah, okay, you guys are good. He built an ark and he was on it. And the Bible says in chapter nine, and verses might come up behind me in a minute here, but that when he, it's basically as soon as he got off the ark, uh, he got drunk. That's what the Bible says. So before you judge him, you know, if you were on an ark for 40 days and it was only animals in your family, you'd probably start drinking too. But anyway, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That's what it says. So we have this idea of Noah's perfect. Noah is one of the greats. Noah is one of the patriarchs. But the Bible says he had a field and he got intoxicated and he was laying in his tent and he was uncovered in his tent. I don't know if he meant to, again, but this is what the Bible says. And so there was some flesh that was exposed. He was, he was naked, some flesh that was uncovered. And the Bible says that Ham, one of his sons, went in and he saw his dad that way. He saw a leader that way and he came back out and he started telling his brothers started spreading kind of gossip about Noah, and he started dishonoring him. And here's, here's my point. It doesn't matter who it is. Behind the pulpit, it doesn't matter how great you might think they are. It's only a matter of time before there is gonna be some flesh, even in leaders, spiritual leaders, that's uncovered. That's what I'm saying. 
And now you guys are all looking at me super holy, so whatever. It's true. Portage? No, I'm just kidding. Some of you, before you start, you know, judging me, I talk to the parking lot attendants, and some of you show your flesh before you even get in the building. So don't, don't come at me. I'm just kidding. Kidding. Listen, there, there, there is no perfect leaders, but we have to have a spirit of honor. And so Noah was in that situation. It says that his other sons, they took a blanket, and they backed up, and they wouldn't even look at him, and they covered up his nakedness. And listen to me, I'm not talking about blatant sin. I'm not talking about spiritual abuse. I'm not saying we make excuses. The Bible says in James, teachers are gonna be held to a higher standard. But I'm saying we can't have a spirit that immediately points at something we don't like, we don't agree with, and dishonors other people in our lives. We can't have that for our families. You wanna know what happened to in this situation? Noah is one of the remaining people, the only ones on the earth after God judged the earth. And he begins at the end of his life to, to call out blessings on his sons. He says to his one son, you're gonna go into this part of the world and God's gonna open these doors for you. And he says to the other son, God's got this plan and this purpose for your life. And then he says to Ham, the one who dishonored him, cursed is Canaan, your son, for the dishonor that you showed. He didn't curse Ham, it was his son. It was a generational thing. And I believe with all my heart, it breaks the heart of God to see families operating in dishonor and modeling it. It affects our children. It affects our families. There aren't any, you're gonna see some, whether it's your parents, your teachers, your coaches, you're gonna see some flesh. Nobody's perfect. But whether you choose to honor or not says way more about your heart than someone else's actions. And that's all I wanna leave you with today. The Bible says honor those in authority, but the last thing is that the Bible says, honor even those who are among you. Romans 12 verse 10 says, outdo one another in honor, showing fervent love and zeal. So don't just honor people that you know can do something for you or people that you might get in trouble if you don't. Honor everyone in your life. Honor your peers, your coworkers. Honor those who serve you. When you go to pick your kids up, honor the young people person who took care of them for an hour and a half. Learn their name. Say thank you. Show honor every chance that you can because I'm telling you, honor is the key that releases the mighty works that God wants to do in our lives. And dishonor is the thing that keeps God from doing what he might even want to do in our lives. You can't receive when you're in a spirit of dishonor. Will you guys stand up with me? want to pray for us and I just kind of felt the Lord in worship um, maybe prompt me to do that I didn't do this in the other services but I, I want to just take a moment and I just want to honor some people in my life um, you know the thing about God is I don't know why some people are in the positions that they are in the Bible says God appoints them God's aware of them but it doesn't always mean they're qualified. You, you might be smarter than your boss. And God might have you in a situation to say, can you still honor, even though you're in a place where you feel like you should be elevated? You know, sometimes God, the Bible says in Corinthians, uses the weak things to confound the wise. Uses the things that aren't necessarily of nobility to confound those who have royalty in their blood. God uses things that normal people might not see as usable to bring glory to him, which might be one of the reasons I have a microphone and I'm standing on this stage. In fact, it is. God, God doesn't always pick the obvious person. I just want to encourage you with that. I feel like God says, if you're willing to honor no matter where you are, you open the door for advancement. You open the door for, for God to use you. And I want to just take a moment. I want to honor my wife, Kendra, who is been with me through 18 years of thick and thin and has been my best friend, my soulmate. These last few years have been tougher in the transition and you have always honored me. Through it, you're a fantastic mother, a wonderful wife, and I honor the gift of prophecy that's in you. I honor the gift of song that's in you, and I thank you for standing by me. I honor Pastor Lee and Jane 
Cummings. I honor the work that they have done in this city, the work that they've done in this church, the tireless zeal, passion, and fervor of prayer that has created what is Radiant Church. I honor them for their sacrifice and I honor them for taking a chance on someone like me. I'm honored to be, I'm honored to be a part of what's happening at Radiant. I, I honor this church body those of you who get here early, who give of your time and your talent and your treasure and you come and you serve and you're a part of this body and you give. And, and, and this, this church was never designed to be about a couple people on a stage. It's the body of Christ functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that God's given every single one of you. I honor in the name of Jesus. And right now I want, I want us to honor the Lord, to honor God. I want you to just close your eyes. If you're comfortable, I want you to lift your hands. And right now, I, God, I honor you for who you are, for reaching down and saving me. I want you right now in your own voice, with your own words, to honor God as your Savior. Honor God as your healer. Honor God as your deliverer. God, you're worthy of praise. God, you are good. There's no one like you, God. We create an arena of honor, a place of praise where you are elevated, where you are valued, where there is weight to your presence, God. We honor you. We crown you with many crowns. Angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and we crown you, Jesus, Lord of all, God of the universe, King of kings. Worthy are you, God. And I pray right now over everyone who's within the sound of my voice, Father, release the mighty works that you have for their lives. Release the mighty works that you have laid up for them in this place where we're honoring you. Bring healing into this body right now, God. Bring restoration where there have been impossible situations and circumstances. I declare the power of God released over every person in this room. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You are the God of the impossible. Your arm is not too short to save. Where you are honored, miracles and breakthroughs happen in our lives. And God, I honor this body and I, in faith, say, God, let your spirit bring what only you can bring, healing, deliverance. God, I speak to addiction right now in the name of Jesus. Those who have been bound, those who have suffered through the chains of addiction, I say where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom in this place, God. Set the captives free in the name of Jesus in this place, God. We honor you. We praise you. We say, God, where the king is, let the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a huge hand clap.